I want to invite you to open a Bible to James chapter 2 as we continue going through this small letter that James wrote to the church in order to give us wisdom on how do we take our faith, this gift of faith that the Holy Spirit gives to us, and put it into action in our everyday lives out in the world by loving our neighbors and serving the people around us and sharing the gospel with them. And so this letter is written to the church, to you and me as believers in Jesus, in order to help us understand what does it look like when I take my faith in Jesus and apply it to the rest of my life. And in all my relationships and all my interactions with the people around me. And in James chapter 2, one of the things that James is going to help us do is he's going to help us address the issue of hypocrisy. So my question for you is, have you ever experienced someone being hypocritical towards you? Maybe it was just a a one-time thing and they're a good person, but this one time... They, they really kind of showed some bad behavior or bad words, right? Um, maybe sometimes we have to work with or be around people that they just are hypocritical. It's not a one-time thing for them. They, they're always behaving that way. One of the things that I know is that when you experience hypocrisy, when you're on the receiving end of it, it hurts, right? Nobody enjoys it. We, we don't like it at all. Because it, it, it ruins the relationship, right? It, it erodes the trust that we have between us and them. Because we expected them to do one thing. They said, oh, well, I'm going to do this for you, or we're going to do this for you, or I, I'm going to help you out in this way. And then when they don't, that hypocrisy stings, right? It removes the trust that, well, I don't know if you're going to come through for me because last time you, you said this, but you did the opposite. And when that trust is broken, the the relationship is damaged, and it can take a long time to repair it. Well, and sadly, the the same thing can happen with with our faith. We, We can boast about how amazing Jesus is and how great God's love for all people and His mercy and His grace and forgiveness for all people that is found in Jesus is. But when we go out into the world and we don't speak that way, when we we say hurtful words, when we don't give forgiveness to people in our lives, when we don't love our enemies like Jesus commands us to, when we don't serve people the way God has served us, we behave hypocritically in our faith. And just like it can damage our human relationships, it could damage our witness to Jesus. And then other people look at it and go, I don't don't know if Jesus is really as good as you say he is. Because I can see your behavior. I can see the words and the behavior of the church. And it's not lining up with the things that you say about God's love and mercy and kindness and grace. And this is the issue that James is addressing in James chapter 2. He's writing to a group of believers. He's writing to the Christian church have become a little lazy in their faith. They become hypocritical in their faith. They boast all about their knowledge of who God is. They boast about their knowledge of the Scriptures. They boast about their knowledge of Jesus. But when it comes to living it out in the real world, they come up short and they behave hypocritically. Their actions don't match up with their words. Their lives don't line up with the faith that they profess. And we know this is true even to this day, right? There's a reason we say in our world that actions speak louder than words, right? It's because we've all been burned by hypocrisy from all kinds of different people and all kinds of different organizations to where we'll believe it when we see it. And so James is addressing the church on this difficult and important issue, this issue that we all need to be honest about and oftentimes repent of so that we can show the world through our words and our actions who Jesus is, how great His love and mercy and grace and forgiveness really are. And in fact, as James is talking about this, one of the things that's awesome about this letter that James wrote to the church is that he's usually referring back to the teachings of Jesus, especially the teachings of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. And in Matthew chapter 5, one of the things that Jesus does is He defines what the people of God are going to look like in the world. 
And so he has the famous teachings of we are the salt of the earth, right? We are the city on the hill. We are the light of the world. And uh, we aren't to hide that light. We aren't to, to cover it up. Instead, we are to take the covers off and show it for the whole world so that it brings light to more and more people. And in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus puts it this way. He says this, In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. And so Jesus is telling His church, His followers, us, the believers in Him, that our light, our actions, our words are to shine out into the world so that more and more people will come to know the goodness of God and to worship and praise Him. See, our faith has a purpose that goes beyond just us. And yes, well, that gift of faith that the Holy Spirit gives to us in Jesus Christ saves us. It justifies us and gives us the gift of eternal life. There's also another purpose for our faith, and that is that it gets lived out in our words and our actions so that other people in the world will learn about how good and loving God is, learn about the forgiveness of sins and the gift of eternal life that is offered in Jesus Christ so that they too can receive that gift, have their sins forgiven, and be given the gift of eternal life. And this is what James is going to talk about in this chapter. He's going to help us understand how do we avoid becoming hypocrites in our faith? How do we, as Jesus says, make sure that our faith is a shining light in the world so that others will come to know the love of God? And so what James is really going to do here is he's going to help us define what biblical, saving, justifying faith is. One of the big misconceptions about the book of James, and especially this chapter, is that James is pitting faith, being the thing that saves us, versus good works. And that couldn't be farther from the truth. What James is doing is he's putting them together and saying they're not enemies, they don't oppose each other. And what he's actually trying to do for us is help us understand what that faith that saves us looks like. He's trying to give us a definition for that biblical, saving, justifying faith in Jesus. And the reality that we're going to learn from God's Word today is that biblical faith is a faith that produces good works so others can learn about the love of Jesus. So we begin point number one or of this definition of biblical faith from James is that a, a biblical, justifying, saving faith is a faith that works, a faith that produces good works. So we read in verse 14 of James chapter 2. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? See, the first thing that we need to be clear is that James is not questioning whether or not faith saves. James believes that faith saves. What he's trying to do here is define what that saving faith is. That's why he asked the question, can that kind of faith save him? See, the question for James is not whether or not faith saves. He certainly believes that, just as the rest of the New Testament teaches us. What James is interested in doing in this section of Scripture is helping us understand what that kind of saving, justifying faith is. And so he goes on in verse 15, If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warmed and filled, but without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Martin Luther, in his teachings, defined faith and works for us. And he says it this way, faith is a divine work in us. It makes us to be born anew of God. And so one of the things that we have to realize is that the faith that James is talking about, the faith that Martin Luther is talking about, is that it is a divine work. That faith is a gift of the Holy Spirit that is given to us by God. And so it is a divine work in us. But Martin Luther says, 
it, it's a faith that makes us new. It kills the old Adam so all of our old selfish, sinful desires are put to death by that faith so we live different lives. That our lives are different based on the before Jesus, before the Holy Spirit gives me the gift of faith, and then after the gift of faith. It kills the old Adam and makes us all together different people in heart, in spirit, in mind, and in all powers. And it brings with it the Holy Spirit. I love this language that Martin Luther uses, that faith is a divine work in us. But it is a work of the Holy Spirit that completely changes us. So we go from being selfish and hypocritical and lazy and idle in our faith to doing good works that love and serve others so that they can hear about the goodness of Jesus. All right, and these questions that James asks of what good is it if we just say, hey, I hope you stay warm and fed, but we don't actually meet their needs. Well, that's a... That's a powerful picture of hypocrisy, right? That if we claim that God loves all people, and, and as James says in James chapter 1, that all good gifts come from God, that He's a generous God, that He loves all people, and He wants to help them. If that's what we claim in our faith, that's what we boast about how good our God is. But then when we see someone in need, we ignore them, we don't help them. That's a a mighty level of hypocrisy. Right? That's, that's telling the world with our actions, maybe God isn't as loving and as generous as we say He is. And as James asked when he says, so also faith by itself, if it doesn't have works, is dead. That's a, that's a dead kind of faith. It's a faith that, that doesn't give life to us, and it's a faith that doesn't give life to others. Right? But the faith that God gives to us is a, a living faith that works out in the world by loving and serving others. Just as Martin Luther says, where it, it transforms us. We become completely different people in our minds, the way we think, the way we speak, in our hearts, the way we treat other people. And then he says, in all powers, basically saying like, and everything we are and everything we do is completely transformed by this divine work of faith in our lives so that we live totally differently. We think and speak and treat others in a unique and loving way. So James and Luther are helping define for us this biblical faith. It's a faith that is a gift from God, but it's a faith that takes that gift and lives a completely different life because of it. That we've been transformed by it, so we end up loving people that we never thought we could love. We end up forgiving people that we never thought we could forgive. We end up being generous in ways that we never thought we could be generous towards others. It's a faith that God works in us in order to bring about more and more people worshiping Him and praising Him because now they know how good Jesus is. Martin Luther in his commentary in Galatians says this, idle faith is not justifying faith. Right? Idle faith is a faith that is self-centered and self-serving. A faith that does nothing to help others is not a biblical justifying faith. The faith that we have been given in the Holy Spirit is a faith that is living and active and produces good works and out of love and service for our neighbor, just as Jesus commands us to do. And one of the joys as a pastor is getting to see this reality in our church in all kinds of wonderful and beautiful ways. We have so many wonderful people serving behind the scenes and doing all kinds of things to serve our church and to serve our community. Just in the last month, our food pantry with all of the volunteers that have stepped up during this time of the pandemic to help out with all the extra need that there is, fed over 99 families just in the last month. You know, and as summer starts, it's, it's time for vacation, Bible school, a way for us to serve the children in our 
in our church family, but also in our preschool and in our community at large. But of course, as the pandemic hit, everybody's plans changed. And so we had wonderful servants and volunteers step up to come up with a new way of how do we share the gospel with these children and with these families in our church and in our school and in our community. And they came up with this brilliant way of, of doing vacation Bible school online and at home. And we've had over 40 kids sign up to be part of our vacation Bible school at home where they are getting to learn each week about God's Love. We even had an adult sign up to participate in VBS because, as they told us, they don't know the stories. They don't know much about Jesus, and they want to learn more about his love. And so what a wonderful opportunity for us to share the gospel with all ages of people in our church and in our community. And see, it's a, it's a wonderful joy that when we get to see our faith that God has given to us being alive and active and at work, it's inspiring, and it kind of brings about other people saying, oh, I want to be a part of that as well. It's a wonderful witness to the world about the goodness of God when we see Him working through us and working through our faith by our acts of love for our neighbors. You know, there's this story in Luke chapter 7 where Jesus is having dinner with a group of Pharisees. These are religious elite people. They know the scriptures incredibly well. They talk all about God and his laws and his commands all the time, and they make sure that they are very determined and deliberate in obeying all of those laws and commands. And so in their culture at the time, they were incredibly revered by the people. People looked up at them and said, they are the ones that are close to God, and we're the ones that are far away. And Jesus is having dinner with them at one point. And as they're sitting down to this dinner, a woman enters the room. And she's called a sinner, but we're not quite sure what she is. But most likely what that means is that she is a promiscuous woman, that she is a prostitute. And so she enters this house and she enters this dining area where all these religious elite people are having dinner with Jesus. And as you read the story, you can kind of feel the tension in the room and see, you know, the, and picture the, the Pharisees looking at her with these judging eyes. And then she approaches Jesus, and she kneels before him, and she begins to weep. And she lets down her hair, and she begins to wash and clean his feet. And then the Pharisees react. The people that claim to be closest to God and to know God better than anybody else respond to this action by judging Jesus and saying, if he was really a rabbi, if he was really a prophet, he would know what kind of woman this is. Meaning, she shouldn't be here. She's such a sinner that she shouldn't come near us or near to God. And we're not quite sure if Jesus just knew what they were thinking or if they kind of said it under their breaths, but Jesus becomes aware of, of their attitude towards her. And he tells a parable, and it's a parable about debts being forgiven. And at the end, Jesus tells us the point of the parable, and he says this, he says, Therefore I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But the one who is forgiven little, loves little. So when we start talking about what does it look like to put our faith into action, to have a faith that is at work in the world by loving other people, one of the ways that we do that is not by just deciding, you know, today's the day I'm going to work harder. We put our faith into action by working in the world and loving other people, by being reminded of the faith that God has given to us. What is the gift that he has given to us in that faith? And as Jesus says, that those who are forgiven little will love little, but those who are forgiven greatly will love greatly. 
See, when it comes to putting my faith and your faith into action, into work in the world by loving others, it starts actually by remembering what kind of faith God has given to me and what God has done for me through that faith, that He has forgiven all of my sins, that He has given me an infinite amount of grace and mercy, more than I could ever imagine or need or use, because His love overflows towards us. And when I understand that, when I realize that the gift of faith that God has given to me is this faith that gives me infinite grace and mercy and forgiveness and love, then I can't help but go out into the world and let that love overflow into other people's lives. And this is what James is doing for us. He's helping us realize that this biblical faith, as Martin Luther says it, this justifying faith is a faith that gives us infinite grace and mercy and forgiveness so that we can't help, as Luther said, but become completely different people. That we are so transformed and changed by God's great love for us that our love overflows and spills out into the world around us, into our homes, into our neighborhoods, and into our workplaces. Now James goes on and he helps define this faith. And so the first thing that he helps us do is realize that this faith that saves, this biblical justifying faith is a faith that works. Number two is that it is a faith that trusts. And so in verse 18, James writes, But someone will say, You have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, and you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. So in verse 19, when he says this, you believe that God is one and great job, that's a good thing. What he's essentially saying is that in the Old Testament, especially in the book of Deuteronomy, the statement that God is one became the foundational statement of faith for the people of God. It's, it's kind of like us saying the Apostles' Creed. It's the equivalent of us saying that Jesus is Lord. And that's a good thing. It's a good thing to to know those things and to acknowledge those things, to say those things out loud. But then James says this, even the demons believe and shudder. So what's he getting at? Well, he's, again, helping us understand what does this biblical justifying faith, this gift of faith that the Holy Spirit gives to us, what is it? What does it look like? What does it do? And the thing is that it is a faith that trusts in God. See, the demons know that statement. They know God is one. Right? We see throughout the Scriptures, especially in the Gospels, that Satan himself quotes the Bible all the time. He does it in a way, though, that twists it and, and kind of turns it into a, a half-truth. But the devil and his demons know God's Word. They know who God is. They know who Jesus is. In fact, in the Gospels, one of the first characters in the Gospels to recognize that Jesus is the Son of the God is a demon. But when he does it, he's completely terrified of Jesus. And the reason that they believe this, they know this, but they're terrified is because they don't trust in God's grace. They don't trust in His mercy. And what a biblical justifying faith does, yes, it works, but it also trusts in God's promises. And so Martin Luther, in the book of Concord, defines this kind of faith for us. He says, faith is a living, daring confidence in God's grace. I absolutely love that definition of faith. It is a living, daring daring confidence in God's grace, so sure and certain that the believer would stake his life on it a thousand times. See, this is what a faith that trusts looks like. It's a daring confidence in God's grace that no matter how much I come up short, no matter how many times I sin, no matter how many times I mess up, that God's grace is for me. And in fact, in 1 John chapter 4, the Apostle John reminds us of this when he says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out all fear. 
For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. And this is in the context that John is talking about how much God loves us. And how much God loves you because of Jesus Christ. And he's saying that God loves you with a perfect love. That he loves you with a perfect grace, a perfect mercy, a perfect forgiveness. So that when you and I come to him in all of our sin and our shortcomings and all the ups and downs of life, we know that through faith we can trust his perfect love. That through Jesus Christ's death on the cross that you are perfectly loved and forgiven by God. So the first thing that James teaches us about a biblical justifying faith, the gift of faith that the Holy Spirit gives us, is that it's a faith that works by loving our neighbors. The second is that it's a faith that trusts in the grace and the love of God. And third, it is a faith that lives. It is a living and active faith. And so he says this in verse 20, Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. Now, this section of the book of James is where a lot of debate and a lot of arguing and back and forth has happened in the church. But again, we have to understand the context that James is writing in. James is writing to the Christian church, the people that already believe in Jesus, already know who Jesus is, and he's trying to help define for them what their faith is. That it is a living faith, a a faith that produces good works. And so when he says, was not Abraham justified by works, he's not saying it's either works or faith. He's not dividing the two. He's actually putting them together. This is why he goes on and he says, we know that faith apart from works is useless and that Abraham's faith was completed by his works. And this is why he goes on and even acknowledges what the scriptures say. He says, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. So even James knows that it is faith that justifies us. That when Abraham was made righteous or counted righteous before God, it was because he believed in God. What James is trying to point out, though, is that that faith that Abraham had, that faith that justified him, that faith that made him righteous before God, was made evident by his actions. That he had a living faith that trusted in God so that when he went out into the world, he put his faith into action. And so Abraham's action and his works completed his faith, as, Ab- as James says, that it showed that Abraham really did have a faith that justifies, a faith that makes him righteous. But there is a lot of confusion on this, that sometimes we try to separate out the two and pit one of saying, well, it's by faith alone, and others will misspeak and say, no, it's, it's by works alone. And then they try to use James as an argument that says, see, we have to do good works to be saved. But that's not what James is doing. What James is doing is he's showing us that a faith that justifies, a faith that makes us righteous, a faith that saves, is a faith that is living and active. And it will be shown and given evidence to by our words and by our works. And in fact, Martin Luther, when he's describing faith, he says it this way. He says, it is a living, busy, active, mighty thing, this faith. This faith that saves us, this faith that justifies us, this faith that saves us by solely trusting in Jesus Christ. Luther describes it this way, living, busy, active. And then he goes on to say this, it is impossible for it not to be doing good works incessantly. Thus, it is impossible to separate works from faith. See, one of the problems that we run into on this debate is when we try to split the two apart. 
and try to say over here is the, the faith side and over here is the good work side. But what the Bible teaches, what James teaches, what Martin Luther teaches us is that they go together. That a faith that saves, a faith that makes us righteous, a, a faith that justifies us before God by the work of Jesus Christ on the cross forgiving our sins is also a faith that will produce good works. That we will be able to see it out in the world by how we live, by how we speak, how we treat our neighbors. And as Luther reminds us that we can't separate the two. And that a living, active faith, a faith that gives us the gift of salvation, is a faith that insists, as Luther says, on doing good works. And then we get to verse 24, the one that causes a, the most controversy, where James writes, You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. And in verse 26, For as the body apart from the Spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. And verse 26 is really important for helping us understand what is James saying, because in verse 24, it really does seem like he's saying, hey, the faith alone stuff is not what justifies it. It's works. But again, verse 26, where he says, faith apart from works is dead, that you and I are not saved by a dead faith. We are saved by a living faith because a living faith is a faith that is in the living God, that Jesus Christ is alive, that he has risen from the dead, and our faith is in him. And so since our Savior is alive, our faith is alive. An interesting thing about verse 24 is it's the one that you would think would cause Martin Luther and the other Reformers a lot of problems because they were the ones that championed the message that we are saved by faith alone, which they got from the Apostle Paul and all the other writers of the New Testament, that we are saved by faith alone in Jesus. But when Martin Luther and the Reformers and his co-workers were working on the Book of Concord, especially the Apology of the Augsburg Confession, they actually address this verse specifically. And it's a bit of a long quote, so, you know, stay with me. This is what they write about this verse. It says, No other passage is supposed to be more contrary to our belief. People say we merit the forgiveness of sins by means of good works, and that good works overcome the terrors of sin and of death. Right, so they're acknowledging that, hey, there's this debate that people try to go back and forth. Is it faith alone or is it by works? And Luther's saying this verse, verse 24 in James, is it's supposed to be the thing that would argue most against us. But here's what he says about it. None of these things came into James' mind. James did not believe that we earn the forgiveness of sins and grace by good works. After all, he is talking about the works of those who have already been justified, of those who have already been reconciled and accepted, and who have already received forgiveness of sins. He also says that a living faith brings forth good works, and as we have said, the saints' good works are righteous and please God because of faith. James praises only good works that are produced by faith. See, what Martin Luther realized is that James is not separating out the two of faith alone and works alone and then pitting them against each other and saying you got to pick sides. What he's saying is that what James teaches us, what our Lutheran tradition teaches us, is that, that faith that saves us, that justifies us, forgives us, gives us the gift of eternal life, is a faith that produces good works. That when we are justified and redeemed by God, we will go out into the world and love our neighbor and serve them. And that they will come to know how good Jesus is. Come to know his grace and forgiveness and mercy through our good works. In fact, Martin Luther gives us a wonderful analogy. He says, it is impossible to separate good works from faith quite as impossible as to separate heat and light from fire. I, I love that picture. I love that analogy. That when you have a fire, 
it automatically produces light and heat because that's what a fire is. That's what a, a fire does. And if you don't have light and heat, guess what you don't have? A fire. And so Luther is saying, when we have saving faith in Jesus, guess what we do? We do good works. We love our neighbor. It's just simply what our faith in Jesus does. In the Gospel of John, Jesus says this. He says, Truly I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, the Son does likewise. So you and I, when we become servants of Jesus, we become believers in Jesus by the gift of faith that the Holy Spirit gives to us. We simply do what we see our Heavenly Father at work in the world already doing. We see Him loving people and serving people. We see Him showing grace and mercy to people. We see Him forgiving people. And so you and I, as redeemed children of our Heavenly Father, do the same thing. We do what we see our Heavenly Father doing. One last teaching from the Book of Concord. It says, good works always follow justifying faith and are certainly found with it when it is a true and living faith. For faith is never alone, but is always accompanied by love and hope. See, my prayer and hope for us as believers in Jesus is that that faith that God gives us, that gift of salvation that Jesus has given to us, would be accompanied by love and hope. And that as we go out into the world, we take that gift of faith that has been given to us and we share the love and hope of Jesus with the world around us. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we give thanks that you have forgiven us, that you have redeemed us, that through the Holy Spirit you have given us the gift of faith. Holy Spirit, help us to make sure that our faith is never alone, but that it is always accompanied by love and hope. And that as redeemed children of God, when we go out into the world, that we would simply do what we see our Heavenly Father doing, loving, serving, and forgiving. It's in your great name we pray. Amen.